take a moment to settle in and orient to the space. And I love when cameras come on so I can see faces. So nice to see your faces. And just so you know, this is recording, but the only time you'll be recorded is if you share something. So if your camera's on now, it's only going to be seen by me and anyone else here looking. So nice to see you. I'm just seeing who's here. I see a lot of new faces that I haven't seen before and I see some lovely familiar ones. I like to start by orienting you to myself and my team. And then we'll go into today's session together. So uh, my name is Luis Mojica. I'm always curious how you find these places. So if you want to tell us, you can. And I'm the founder of Holistic Life Navigation. And I love teaching people um, the style of somatics that I have learned and that I've kind of mm, transformed in my own body around relating to the body as a being. So the animism of the body. And it really creates this ability to relate to the different parts of ourselves instead of over identify with what was done to us or what our body's experiencing. And I found there to be a lot of freedom in that. So I'm going to introduce my team to you. They'll introduce themselves, but I'll call upon them and then we'll get into this. Uh, Marika. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Marika. I'm the operations manager here. So I run the business part of it. Uh, so if you ever sign up for a course or um, you have any questions um, like about your account or something, I'm basically the one who does that. And then I just really enjoy learning in these spaces with you. So I'm really glad to see everybody here today. Camille. Hi, everyone. I'm Camille. I am a community manager and assistant teacher here at HLN. Um, I came to uh, this work in Luis through my own healing journey, and it's been absolutely profound in my life. And I am so fortunate to now have the chance to support others. Um, and so I will be here assisting Luis as he uh, teaches today and also throughout today's session. As you have questions from time to time, you will be uh, you can uh, DM me as well um, and I will be supporting you there. Thank you for coming. And Evan. Hi, everyone. My name is Evan. I'm the admin assistant here. And if you ever have any questions that are tech related or just any general questions, you can always contact me if you send an email to info at Holistic Life Navigation, that's me. Uh, and I also offer um, sound healings here through our membership and through the course. And I'm just really happy to be here and drop in with everyone. Thank you, my friend. So these are the bodies that hold this, this creature together, this creature and HLN creature. So I'm really happy for you to meet them if you haven't before. And like Camille said, you can DM her anytime. I'm not going to get DMs through here. So if there's anything you want to write through the chat, write it to Marika or Evan or Camille, and they can redirect you to the right person if, if the, there's something they cannot help you with. So I guess the first thing I want to say is these somatic drop-ins, the whole point of them is to get like a taste of community work, of the way as a global community, because people from all over tune into this, can connect and relate and find um, sense of self with each other through the body. And so I don't come in with a certain idea. I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. I come in to relate to the group. So that means I really like to open these up with some weaving. We do about 10 minutes of that because it's an hour session. Weaving means you can raise your hand. If you look at the bottom, you'll see reactions. And you'll see raise hand. You can raise your hand and we ask everybody to really feel into their body and just have like a precise thing they want to presence. So it's not a process. It's not really even a long share. It's more of a presence. Like what's in your body that wants to be seen, whether it's literally, I come here with grief in my heart and I want to be with that. You can say that you can say, I come here really wanting to learn more about what overcoupling means. You can say that whatever you want to presence here, we have 10 minutes to do so. So not everyone's going to be able to, but just feel again into your body, feel the precision of one wants to be expressed. And if you don't want to share publicly, you can send a DM to, uh, let's say Marika or Evan. And if you send a DM to either of them, they'll speak for you anonymously. But Camille will be calling on people who have their hands up. 
So just notice again, know that you're being recorded and you can uh, share with your face, with your image, or you can turn your camera off, whatever feels more comfortable. But let's begin the weaving because that really helps me kind of feel what's in the field, what are people interested in, and then from there we'll dive into some stuff. Okay. And um, again, just to reiterate, we're going to keep this to 10 minutes, so you may not get to everybody, and we may pause you as you're sharing so that we can get to two folks. Um, and if I mispronounce your name, I invite you to please correct me. Uh, so, Roger, please come off mute. Uh, Roger, where did you go? <laughs> You're still muted, Roger. There we go. Okay, there. So sharing how I'm, how I'm feeling right now. Was, yeah, how you're feeling, what you're wanting from the session, whatever you want to presence. Yeah, uh, I feel anxious in my chest, uh, like hearing my my heart, and that is something that I'm very curious about because all negative feelings, more or less, I always feel them here. I I I can't manage to feel anxiety or in, like anywhere else in my body. I only feel it here. And that's been the case for basically my whole life. And that is something that I'm curious about how I can can feel. I can feel like positive feelings all over my body, but the quote unquote negative feelings I only feel here. And that's, that's something that I'm very curious about. Thank you, Roger. Diane, please come off mute. Uh, one minute, Diane. I think Karina figured it out. Okay, no problem. I'm going to be much less than a minute, I imagine. We'll come uh, right back to you. Well, yeah, we'll do Diane. Oh, you want to? No, no, go for it, Diane. Go for it. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't realize you were saying to switch, but okay. Um, so I spent many, many years being totally dissociated and just living from my neck up. So for me, I am desperately, not desperately, but maybe very strongly wanting to really let my body participate and speak to me. So that's where I'm at. Thank Beautiful. you. Beautiful. Love it, Diane. Thanks. Karina. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I... Today, especially, I realized that most of my life I live like in a, all the time stress, like my body is like this. And today, I think it's because supplements I'm taking and work that I'm doing inside, I'm calm. So I would like to know how to stimulate more my nervous system to live in this way and not in the other way that is so exhausting. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you, Karina. Katie, please come off mute. Hello. Thank you so much. Um, I am here today because I'm an only child of two parents who are in the aging and dying process. It's bringing up a lot of triggers in my body. And sometimes when I get very overwhelmed, I actually can't tell if I'm doing well or doing poorly. Like, I just completely can't tell. So I thought that being in community in particular would be a really wonderful way to explore that non-dual <laughs> sense of being lost. Thank you so much. Gorgeous. Thank you, my friend. Savan, please come off mute. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so for most of my life, I have lived in this uh, scarcity mindset. So I never felt that I was good enough. Um, and also disappointing my loved ones because of the, you know, the expectation that I put on myself and uh, never reaching those goals and expectations. So I, I felt this uh, sort of shame and guilt within myself that I would like to release. Um, and this anxiety of, you know, of, of what what does the future hold? So I don't, I don't want to think about that. I would like to live in the present. 
Um, yeah, that's about me. Thank you, Saban. Thank you so much. Um, a new rock up. Please come off mute. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, yeah, I'm just... I just would like to to presence, like, the, the beautiful in-between. Like, last night I went through, like, a, a pattern I do when I feel really overwhelmed and I feel myself shut down and I still did the pattern, but I also attempted to give myself compassion for the fact that I didn't know another way to be with what was. So, yeah. Yeah, I feel that in my heart. I love the way you put that. And thank you for that. Um, Aaron, please come off mute. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thanks for doing this, Luis. Um, so I, I think I'm relating to some themes right now of um, uh, boundary and witness, and then also severity. Um, I am kind of coming, there's obviously a lot of nuance that's required in, in relating to these concepts, but like, for example, in the last week, I have like really severe health conditions. So I have about like an hour of movement a day I'm dealing with. Um, hopefully it's not, you know, TMI, just, you know, tremors, spasms, uh, petite mal seizures. So there's like that kind of base level of capacity that gets removed, but that in relating to the boundary premise, it's, it's like the boundary is kind of with yourself. It's l like less with an, you know, another force. There's, there's actually nobody to relate to because you're so isolated. Um, and so like, you know, the, the witness is then this kind of passive space, but I find myself benefiting from taking that kind of witnessing into a really active space and channeling some of that anger and that rage. But it's, it's difficult because it's kind of a feedback loop. Like you're, who's violating the boundary is me, not anybody else. Maybe it's learned it from something else. And so I, it's like the, the phrase that you used of like, you know, we're listening to the body, but we're not following it. I'm like, I feel like it's kind of like, I'm not even trying to follow it. I'm trying to like, get moving, like, don't do this. Like, it's a very forceful not following. So hopefully some of that makes sense. Maybe there's more of an implicit, you know, um, question in that. But yeah, I hope that that resonates for you. It does. Thank you, my friend. Sorry, Luis, were you saying something? Nope. Okay. Uh, Cecilia, please come off mute. Hi. Um, thank you for this session. And I'm sorry I can't put my, I can't figure out how to get my face up there. So that's that. But um, I am participating. And uh, recently I've been challenging my physical limitations more. And I'm having to remind myself to breathe. And, and earlier this year, I was in a really good space with. Um, you know, almost reliable daily yogic breathing. So I'm, I'm just when I need the breath to challenge, I am reminding myself that it's like, wow, I stopped breathing about two hours ago. So let's make a connection for me there. Thanks. Thank you, Cecilia. That's great. Really good awareness. So we're going to shift over to, um, Evan and Marika to read some things that are written. So if your hand is up, please put it down. We're going to pause our video sharing for now. Uh, Evan, do you want to go first? Sure. I can share a few of these that came through. Let's see. Um, on my mind, ways to increase capacity. Uh, I come with social anxiety and I'm looking for how to be grounded and embodied in social interaction. Feeling lots of emotions and sadness, loneliness, and need tools to overcome these. Uh, grieving the loss of my grandmother. I'm feeling overwhelmed today with the weight of it pressing on my shoulders and my back. The desire is strong to rest. Do one more. Sure. I'm dealing with the intersection of CPTSD and AST. Noise in my building is triggering so much rage and panic and ungroundedness. Rapid speeding up in my body, feeling overwhelmed. Thank you. Marika, can you give us three or four? Yeah, actually, there were some common themes. Um, someone was looking for somatic techniques to feel more energized and alive. Plus, a lot of people wrote in about waking up numb parts and being in freeze, being present with shame, <clears throat> uh, working through old family traumas, self-trust, 
Um, a lot of people were here to be in community, and then someone brought up overcoupling versus undercoupling. Ooh, so much, so much good material. So the way my brain and body works is I take in a lot of information that people are giving, and then things come out. So um, we're not just like politely asking you to share just to check it off. I'm really taking in everything I'm hearing and seeing like, what what's what's lighting me up that feels like it wants to come through today and, and be shared. And a couple of things just from what I heard in the, the these shares was body listening. I'm going to start with just so we can understand that body listening doesn't always mean it feels good and becoming embodied doesn't always mean it feels good. So we can have this idea of embodiment that's through more of a duality lens that when I'm embodied, I'll be at peace. Life will be easy. I'll feel really good. Embodied just literally means I'm feeling what my body's experiencing. Like I'm in the biology of my experience. That's what embodied means when we speak about that. So sometimes you are embodied to your stress. Other times you're embodied to your joy. So I'm wanting us to go start this session off with an awareness of a non-dual, a non-binary way of being with the body, which is just embodiment means I'm feeling what I'm experiencing now. So let's just pause to feel that and notice that for ourselves. And in this pause, <clears throat> excuse me, in this pause, even asking yourself, how much have you overcoupled the idea of embodiment with something pleasant? Like it's only actually embodiment when I'm feeling peaceful or stress-free or joyful. It's like, no, anxiety is embodiment. Sadness is embodiment. Pain is embodiment as is joy, as is peace, as is love, as is excitement. All that is embodiment. So one reason I'm saying that is because when we start practicing embodiment, we tend to start feeling things that are uncomfortable and inconvenient, and we judge them as wrong. And the moment we judge them as wrong, this inner exile happens, where a part that comes up to speak to us, like when someone's like, Diane said, I want to listen to my body, I want it to speak with me. When it comes up to speak with us, we don't actually have control over which part speaks. That's what's so scary about doing embodiment practices. You don't know what part's going to wake up and show itself to you. So when it does, the bigger practice then is how do I receive and relate to that part? The embodiment is not the, the be all end all. The embodiment is like the entrance right into the sensation. The big work is my relationship to the sensation. So if I have a sadness, I'm thinking of Roger when he was saying about this constriction in the heart, in his chest, right? If I feel this thing in my chest, how do I relate to that thing? Especially underlining, especially when it's the unknown. When I don't know what it means. When I don't know what it's about. It's just this, what we would call like general anxiety or like a mystery experience, a mystery sensation. How do I relate to it? Does my mind make up a bunch of things that are really scary about the sensation? Do I judge the sensation and be like, I shouldn't be feeling that now, or I wish I wasn't feeling that now? If those things are happening, we experience a secondary activation, right? So this primary activation, let's say the tension in the chest, is then met with a judgment or a fear or a story that's unpleasant, and then a secondary activation occurs. Instead of if I meet the thing in my chest with a curiosity, like, oh, hey, who are you? And I put my hand, we're going to do this later together. Actually, let's do this right now. Let's all notice a place in our body that feels uncomfortable. And if you can't feel your body, let's grab a pillow. And if you're grabbing a pillow, just put it in the front of you and give it a nice hug and just give your body a moment to land with where you are. So those of you with a pillow, those of you without, just feel what your body's touching. That's the easiest way to say this. The chair you're on, the ground under your feet, the pillow on your face, or rather your chest, your belly, your hand on your face, like whatever you're noticing. But you're, see how your body experiences this touch, this support first. Again, remember, no expectations. We're just seeing what do I feel here? Now, what do I want to feel? What do I actually feel? And then using your eyes, take in your room a little bit, just to gain some sense of the room, to see where you physically are in this moment. And as you do this, start noticing, are the sensations in my body 
congruent with the room I'm in. Meaning if I'm looking at this beautiful plant next to me, do I feel anxiety in my chest looking at this plant? That would be an incongruency because there's no threat here. I can see that, but my body has a different story. That's important information because most of our bodies haven't learned yet how to attune to where they are. They're still reverberating in the echo of what happened or in the expectation of what's going to happen, but they are unable to feel where they are. They're unable to feel the temporary current moment where there is no threat. So you really want to first notice that. As you notice that, then you put your hand over the place that felt the sensation, the place that felt the fear, the tension, the pain, overwhelm, pressure, even numbness, like a place is just hard to even be with. You put your hand there. And notice how that place that you're touching responds to your hand. So this is the animism of sensation. How does that place respond to you? Just pause and there's no work you have to do here. You just have to pause and notice what happens. And I would love if you would DM um, Marika, just so we can get a couple um, responses. What do you notice? What happens? What does that part do as you touch into it? And while I wait for those, just like I was saying in response to what Roger had shared, this is us starting to relate. So getting embodied first, feeling what we're embodied to, what's the sensation, touching the sensation to be with it and seeing how it responds to us being with it, not figuring it out, not trying to get rid of it, just being with it. How does it respond to that? Do you want to share some, Marika? My heart opens, reassurance, the pain went away. It's hard to stay with the sensation. That part opens up, tingles and vibrates. My chest feels greeted, it can soften a little. A scream for help. It constricts. Uh, deeper, slower breaths, tears come up, it melts and feels held and supported. My body feels unsafe. Let's pause there. So as you're hearing those, just notice how your own mind is judging some of those. Like some of you might think, oh, that's a good experience. Oh, that's a bad experience. Just seeing if that happens as you hear those. The art of embodiment is not judging the experience it's being with it okay it's just like if a child if one child was crying and the other one was laughing and you look at the crying child like that's the bad one and you look at the laughing child like, that's the good one like how would that affect a child you might have experienced that as a child yourself that's what happens in our bodies. That's what's so fascinating about the self-relationship work through a somatic lens is the animal body experiences our own shame, our own fear, our own judgment about what's happening inside of it. Okay. So when you hear some of these shares, you hear some people that are having, we can say pleasant. Some of those were pleasant experiences like, ah, oh, something opened, something released. I feel like I'm here. That's pleasant. Some people had unpleasant. I don't feel safe constriction, pressure, and overwhelm. Neither are good or bad. What's fascinating is when you have stored trauma, you have a stored amount of energy of life force that wants to come out and doesn't know how to. It's stuck in the bones and the joints. So when you start embodying yourself and you're touching in, your body actually starts to notice it's safe. And in the noticing of safety starts to unfold some of those things it's in packaging. And in that unfolding, it's initially stressful and activating and uncomfortable. We attach to those sensations as something must be going wrong. And then we either fear them and we add that external, uh, rather secondary activation, right? Through the fear or the judgment, or we reflexively go into auto-regulation, which are the ways we avoid sensation. Watching TV, eating food, you know, excess food, addiction of any kind, calling somebody that distracts us from ourselves, which isn't a bad thing. None of these are bad. It's just what we do when we don't know how to be with the sensation. Anuradha said it earlier, and it really touched me. I have found compassion for myself because I didn't know another way. That's all it comes down to. It's that innocent. We just don't know another way. 
And so even feel that for yourself for a moment and see how your body responds to that. Instead of being harsh to the body or judging it, oh, you just didn't know another way. Like, how does it respond to you saying that or even hearing me say that? Just notice. Those of you that are noticing this, that are feeling this, you're already doing the practice of becoming the conscious witnesser, where like your spirit, your soul, your witness, your consciousness is watching and observing and feeling the body rather than being the sensations. It's a very, very big difference, right? This is the difference between I am anxious and I feel anxiety in my chest. So again, going back to you, just noticing your body. And if you're feeling activation, if you're feeling a, a movement or an overwhelm or an energy, literally ask it how it wants to move you. And just notice, do you stretch? Do you yawn? Do you cry? Do you lay down? Do you get a glass of water? Do you get up? Like literally see how it wants to move through you and try it right now intuitively. How does your body want to move? There's no wrong movement. And as your body moves from this place, from this feeling in the body, just see how it responds to it. One of the last things we do when we feel anxiety or stress is move. We tend to feel the anxiety and we have a reflexive bracing, which just makes the anxiety more potent. It increases the potency, it like compacts it, right? So when anxiety or any kind of stress or charge gets compacted, it gets more potent and more uncomfortable because it isn't able to spread out and metabolize. So when we learn, when I feel something, I'm allowed to move from that. It starts to shift because it starts to spread through the movement. And as it spreads, it becomes less potent and the body can start metabolizing it like it knows how to do. So I wanted to just really start today by talking about charge and that it is, I say all, often that charge is non-binary, charge is non-dual. Charge doesn't have a good or bad, charge is charge. The charge you feel from being anxious is the same charge you feel from being excited. The only difference is one charge gets stuck, one charge moves. But I'm really happy to see someone, I'm like, I'm like jumping up and down, like the charge is moving and I call it happy and excited. When I'm crunching in on myself, imagining doing a speech and I'm scared and the charge isn't moving, it's curling in, I call it anxiety or fear or stress. So charge at its root, nothing, it's all the same. How the body responds to it is where we have different emotional experiences. Angst, rage, joy, sadness, grief. All those are just ways we name the way charge is being stuck or moving. That's really good news because as you practice embodiment, even right now with me, as you're feeling your body a little more, maybe some of you might not, that's okay, but you might be feeling your body more. And as you do, you might start noticing that right now. Like, oh, if I don't judge the charge of it, just let it move through me. Something is different about that. Something happens, right? Charge is the first stage of movement in the body. And what we've learned is to brace against the charge, to appear calm and collected, okay? To repress the charge by further compacting it and making it more potent. That's really important. Dissociation is what ends up happening next. Dissociation is a gift from the body and it's also very difficult when it's the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> when it's a temporary gift, it's like, thank you. When it's an endless gift and there's no, no running out of it, it gets really overwhelming. Because so the dissociation is your body's natural anesthetic. Like when someone says, I'm numb, or I can't feel, or I'm outside of myself. The body is naturally being anesthetized from the inside out. It's doing that because the amount of charge in your body has reached this kind of critical point where it starts dysregulating your system. Dysregulation is when your body can't metabolize the charge. You actually start getting inflamed from it. It's a biological experience. Your chemistry changes inside. It's not just my mind feels dysregulated. My bones, my muscles, my joints, my nerve endings, my body starts to get inflamed and out of balance. It's a hormonal condition because you're also making a lot of adrenaline. 
So it affects your digestion. It affects your sex hormones. It affects the way you sleep. It affects so many parts of our biology and how we live and how we move and how we express, right? So just to feel that for a moment as you understand why dissociation is such a gift, because it's the way the body says, too much for you. It's not going anywhere. I'm going to give you a break from feeling this. And it removes you from its experience. It, like it kicks you out, right? Until you have a moment where you can come back in and metabolize it. While you're dissociated, nothing's being processed, mind you. It's just a pause, right? The opposite actually it tends to happen. Instead of being processed, it can even build more. And this is why dissociative coping mechanisms put people into deeper states of numbness and freeze and isolation, because you're already at the, the tipping point for dysregulation. You're going into dissociation. And then let's say you're binge watching four hours of Netflix, right? Those four hours of binge watching are taking you further from your body, activating your system more. And then you come back into your body, let's say to go to sleep and you are riddled with panic and anxiety and insomnia and racing thoughts. Because nothing changed in your chemistry. It just got bigger, but you weren't there to experience it. So part of the gift of dissociation is you get this temporary relief physically and even mentally from your situation so you can be functional. You can go into the world and work. You can raise your kids. You can walk home. You can drive somewhere. You can do all these things without actually embodying yourself, which is quite like far out if you think about it. You know, the, the, Having a body is a very psychedelic experience. And then when you start coming back to the body, like I said, you're coming back to a room that's been disorganized and things that has been thrown in for hours. And you're like, how did all this get here? So we come back into these bodies without a way to be with all that stuff that's left. We're like, what do I do with this? And then we're more overwhelmed than we dissociate again. So we live in this kind of constant place of touching in, it's unbearable, dissociating, right? So this little thing we just did, this little practice of touching in and just being with it, not thinking about it, not figuring out, not knowing its story, not trying to get rid of it, but being with it is a really practical first step toward titrating being in your body more, feeling more sensation, teaching your body it's safe with you. If the body's an animal, it has to learn to trust us. If we're always dissociating or judging it, not a lot of trust is being built. And it's not our faults. This is very uh, reflexive. No one consciously chooses to dissociate. It's something that happens reflexively, meaning the body is doing it for you. So I wanted to say that very clearly for those of you that feel shame because you're immobile or you oversleep or you feel numb or you have no motivation, you procrastinate. These are all examples of someone's body who's stuck in freeze. You're not in freeze. You are beyond your body. Your body is stuck in freeze and your body goes into freeze when there's excess charge. How many people grew up going to school, learning every year how to deal with the charge in their body? <laughs> Raise your hand. I, I have yet to meet anybody. So it's, it's really important that we honor how unknown this is and how new it is to our memory, but how ancient it is to our ancestors. It's a relearning. In the modern world, we'll, we'll say it's new. It's a rediscovery, a reimagining, a re-understanding, okay? A reminding. But what's really cool about the body is it remembers. It remembers lineages of memory. So once you start touching into the soma, like your ancestors wake up in your bones, regardless of where your ancestors are from. And you get so much access to the way the body knows how to move through these big things, which is pretty profound. So it's not even anything someone teaches, even though I'll use those terms. Like I teach people how to find safety in their body. It's really like I give you the practice, you do it, and then your body shows you everything, and then it's yours. It's like no one else can have that. It's, it's in you. Right. So I wanted to bring that in so we can understand that piece. Um, I'm going to pause. Camille, anything you want to add to any of this in your language? Um, I want to recognize that, I, and some of you shared this in the feedback, that it was hard to stay with the charge. And it absolutely is. It's hard to stay with the sensation, one, because we may not have the practice of doing it, but two, noticing Am I with it from a place of judgment or a place of curiosity? It is difficult for us to just witness the sensation. It is difficult to not want to fix it, to not want to make it feel better. That is part of this process as well. And there's nothing wrong with that. That is generally what we're taught to do. You fix it, you make it right, you make it go away. I want to be healed. 
Learning to witness and simply observe the sensation is a practice in and of itself that we have to begin to develop. With that piece, let's do a group practice. So this works best when you can lie down or support yourself in being held, even if you're sitting up. So if you have like an office chair, you hold your head back on it. If you're against a wall, like you can put a pillow up. If you're outside, you can lay in the grass, you can lay on the floor. Like really just take a moment to get your body situated. And then we'll do a group practice just around what Camille was saying. And again, as you get situated, just even notice how your body feels taking a break from the screen. And if you're in front of the screen, like I am, just look beyond it for a moment, look away from it and just see like, how does it feel in my body when I reposition, when I move, what happens to that charge? What does it do as I shift? Just noticing that for a moment. And then slowly noticing what is my body able to feel right now? Capacity is not your choice. Capacity is your body's choice, which is like very humbling and very frustrating when you want to have capacity for things. Your body is choosing what it can handle. You can choose to bypass it, and we do many times. But in this case, right now, we're going to be with our capacity because we have the privilege to do so. We have, let's say, five minutes where we can just lay here together and do this. So notice, what am I able to feel? And I'm going to give you three kind of um, uh, specific, um, I don't know what I even like to call them. There's always different names for, for them. Identities, characteristics, labels, just three different ways to feel for sensation, okay? The first one is to notice constriction. Identify any part of your body that's holding tension. Any part of your body that's holding stress, pressure, pain is also a form of constriction. And if there's 20 parts, just focus on one. Don't overwhelm yourself too much. But just find one place that's constricted and just notice it. Just so you can feel what constriction really feels like as you lay here. And those of you listening in the replay, when you watch this, do it with us. Okay. Then notice a place that's the opposite of that, what I would call expansion, a place that feels easeful, a place that feels soft, a place that has pleasure, a place that is peaceful or feels safe, these kind of words we would use. Where does that live in you? And while you look for these, don't even think about, uh, I should feel this, because if you don't find that, that's okay. You're getting to know where your body is right now. There's nowhere it's supposed to be. So just notice where do I feel some ease, where do I feel some openness? And then notice where do I feel nothing? Where do I feel numb? Where do I feel hard? Like, where is it hard in my body to even access a sensation or a feeling? If I didn't touch my legs or if I didn't touch my nose, what I know was there. Like what places feel difficult to embody? This is just giving you a scan of your body just to get some very simple understandings of what you're feeling and where and the differences between these sensations and states. Now, let's say, let's go to what Camille was talking about. Let's, let's presence that constriction, that place that feels stressed, that place that has pain, that place that has pressure, anxiety, fear, if you're naming it. If you're not naming it, just the feeling of something with pressure and tension. And you can put your hand there, you can send your breath there, you can just have your your mind go there, like your attention, but the hand is my personal favorite. And just see, again, how does this place respond to you? What does it do? It might get bigger. It might have no response. It might shift. There's no right response to see what does it do when I touch into it. And while you're holding in this place, while you're with this place, simultaneously notice that place that felt expansion, the place that felt ease or feels ease, feels expanded, feels safe or comfy. It might be the pillow on your head. It might be the blanket. It might be the smell in the room and you feel in your nose. Like what part of your body feels something pleasant? 
If you can't access it, open your eyes and use your eyes. Look around and focus on something visually pleasant in your room and notice where you feel that in your body. We're looking to gain access to one place that's constricted, one place that isn't. And as you start getting access to that, you're entering a very, very important uh, phenomenon of these multiple dimensions within you, somatically, not mentally, but physically. Like, whoa, I can have anxiety in my chest and total peace in my feet. Yes, it actually happens all the time. I feel constriction in my shoulders and my belly is like soft and totally fine. Yes, happens all the time. What also happens all the time is we get fixated on the pain because it's so loud and it's an alert. It's supposed to get our attention. The constriction is supposed to get our attention. So it gets all of our attention. We lose the whole rest of our body. So as you hold these two other places, one hand on each preferably, but even if you can't reach them or you don't want to, just noticing where these two places live, just going from one to the other, we call this pendulation, sitting in the constriction for a couple seconds, taking a breath, and then moving your attention to the place that isn't constricted for a couple seconds and taking a breath into that. I'm going to do a couple of these. So swing back to the place that's constricted and be with that. And when I say be with it, I mean inhabit it. Breathe into it. Let it be alive in you. It might move you. Sounds might come out. Emotions might come out. Images, like so many things can emerge. Let them. And then even if you have to interrupt what's coming up, take a, a break and go to that place that felt soothed, that felt more open. Breathe into that. Same thing. Let that move you. Let that have any sound it might have, images, wherever that pleasance is in you. How does it want to live through you? I'm going to do two more. Swing back to the place that's constricted. Really be with it. And again, this time, really ask it, how do you want to move through me? And just notice. And sometimes your body will not move. And that's how it wants to move. It wants to be still. How does it want to stretch? What sound does it want to make? Does it want a certain kind of touch? Like, how does it want to be interacted with? How does it want to move this constriction? Okay, and then slowly, finally going to that place that had some ease. Really feeling into the place that had some ease and just noticing, how does this want to live in me too? Are the two communicating? Are they separate? Are they coming together? What's happening in your body as you go back and forth with this? So let's just take a real minute just to pause and feel what we're going through. I'm not going to speak for a minute. And just slowly noticing, noticing how much you notice in a minute. Like when you're embodied, there's a lot there in a minute. It can be really long and take you really deep into parts of yourself. Just see what it's like just to start orienting your eyes back to the camera when you're ready, back to the phone or computer, whatever you're looking at. And you can stay in the pose you're in or the posture you're in, or you can start getting up. I want to go into some sharing in a moment. So anyone that's feeling called to want to share, you know, start coming toward your, your computer or your camera. If you're not, just relax. You can lay down still, whatever you want to do. Okay. Now, one thing I want to say before we share, Evan just put a link in the chat. Our six-week course opens on Thursday for registration to the public. If you use this link today, you get the early registration, which is for two more days. Anyone that signs up early gets one month for free in our library membership. 
So a month before the course starts, there's a ton of resources and practices you can start doing to prepare yourself for the course. And we're doing a huge event on Saturday. It's a four hour event and it's free and you're all welcome to that. You can see it on the website to sign up. Maybe actually, Evan, could you also put the link for that in the chat? Thanks. And that's uh, another great way to be introduced to the work in a much deeper, slower manner. I mean, four hours and we're going to cover a lot. So uh, that's called the somatic experience. And that's also in the chat right now. Okay. So I'd love to do some weaving. Hands are already up, which is great. Um, Camille will take over and call in the hands. And just like we saw when we opened this, really precise sharing, which I loved, like precise. You know, I love 30 seconds or less in a big group. So then people don't get too overwhelmed. I just want to know where that went for you. I want to know what emerged. I don't want to even... Um, answer any questions right now. I want to hear your wisdom. Like, what did your body show you in that? Okay, let's see. Janine, please come off mute. Hi, y'all. Um, I have so much grief in my body, and that's what really wanted to come through and what wanted me to presence it and share it. I have such a um, deeply somatic and sensual way of moving and expressing. And that's how my body feels the most nourished and soothed. And I feel this deep grief of how held in I was taught to be in school and just as a child and how unnourished and unsoothed and frightened that left me. So I really felt kind of the interplay of moving and breathing and I was vocalizing and how good and natural that feels and that fear and that grief of, is this okay? Am I safe in this? And just out. Thank, Thank you. you for that. It's beautiful, Janine. Um, Amaka, please come off mute. And I just want to orient everyone. We're just going to do five minutes of this weaving, and I'm going to go into a couple more things. We're probably going to go over a couple minutes. Thank you. Um, I was struck by how immediately really intense and deep sadness came up as I was going back and forth, and the messages that came through were so clear when I was being with um, what was really uncomfortable, what was difficult, that sensation I heard, please help me, please help me over and over again. And when I moved to the part of my body that felt easeful, restful, I heard, please love me, please love me. And I kept going back and forth and the, to have the capacity to hold both. I'm kind of in awe that the body can do that all at one time in just a few minutes. So some deep gratitude. Thank you. Isn't that amazing? Thanks for presencing that. Irene, please come off mute. Um, I uh, was looking at a trapezoid of light and my wall that was sort of to connect with the pleasant and I really could feel the like pleasant sensation spreading and then kind of noticed how like that would almost bring up constriction and tears like the emotions would kind of come up as like almost a maybe a wall of how much of that kind of pleasant safety I can allow before something kind of meets it with a little bit of a little overwhelm even my hand is shaking a little bit talking about it yeah I just have to say uh that's one we're spending one session we're doing four 45 minute sessions on Saturday, this four hour event. And one of the sessions is exactly on what you just named my capacity for pleasance, my capacity for joy and pleasure. That's a big part of this work. So thanks for naming that. Uh, let's do one more video one, Camille, and then anyone that's presencing anything to Evan and Marika, we can hear from. Okay. Um, Tanya, please come off mute. I was literally going to lower my hands. <laughs> it caught me off guard. First, I just have to say, I've been to a few of these drop-ins. This is the most strongly emotional one I have felt. The charge to me feels very strong. 
And um, I was met today with a lot of shame, and I really appreciate what Louise said about the I am chronically ill, and a gentleman who spoke about chronic illness. Mm -hmm. I really connect with that energy. And shame is like the little wagon that goes behind chronic illness. So being able to feel that and in the circle, I just really appreciate the embodiment of feeling shame and then being able to allow it to be really loud, but also let it be blanketed with compassion, like was spoken with earlier, because I cried when he said the body just my body doesn't know any other way. Shame was beat into me. So being able to allow compassion to come in and breathe in my body was very beautiful. So I thank everyone. And I really, I appreciate that statement. Shame was beat into me because when we're abused by people and we're shamed from people, it's because they don't even have capacity to see what we're going through because they didn't have capacity to see what they were going through. So their fear that arises in their body just wants to like squelch out what's happening in ours because they can't handle it. So it really helps us understand even how this gets passed down generationally. So I, I appreciate you saying that. And I'm so glad you had that experience today where you could be with these pieces. Um, Marika, do you want a presence three if there are? Um, actually, there was a few and they all kind of came around to the same thing, which was I wanted to share that I felt really held by the collective for the first time in a long time. That was great. And another person saying that um, that grief is why they came here. And it was really lovely to hear other people who, in, in a community, that they know that this is where that they should be healing it together. So beautiful. Evan, do you have one or two to presence? Uh, I didn't get any additional messages. I just had some questions about the course that I was answering. Okay, great. If you have any questions about any of the events, send those to Evan. He'll ha handle all your events questions. So these are such beautiful shares, and there is a real tenderness to this particular group this time that I'm feeling and I'm, I'm loving. Uh, I don't know why, but these things just happen, right? And I, I wrote a couple of things I thought were really important to close with just in these shares. That piece that Janine brought in around grief and like what I heard, the lineage of holding. Know, how we're raised to hold how we're taught to hold it's it's a really important piece here because if we think about charge as desire to move and we hear things like movement as medicine like when it comes to stress when it comes to anxiety and trauma and, and stored charge movement is the way the charge literally gets to leave the joints so if we are raised to brace against inconvenient strange movements like i remember when i was growing up i was called bad even for moving a certain way in school you're told that the way your body wants to move is wrong so you learn to brace against it and this is where we develop the judgment of these states so when we feel a grief or a pain or a desire to do something we judge it right away because we internalize again how we were met growing up in that <clears throat> so i think it's just important to sit with for a moment just to really all of us take just a moment with our body and think, what's my personal lineage of being taught to brace, of being taught not to move, of being taught to appear to look one way when I'm actually feeling the other, right? What's our personal experiences with that? Just to give us a real fertile moment, a couple seconds, just to feel that. Because the amount of years you've been on this earth, that's how long your body has been practicing that. And that's why it's it's impossible to assume and expect in one session, in one month, in one year of doing work like this, it's just you're going to be free in your body. Like how many years, how many decades, how many generations have you come from of people practicing bracing? It's something your body knows and it's something your body, when I say overcoupled, I'm talking about somatic associations. Your body has overcoupled bracing with safety. If I brace, I'll stay safe. I'll assimilate, I'll belong, I'll get by. Okay. So when you realize that your body believes bracing is safety, the dissolve of the bracing means defenselessness. And that doesn't feel safe when your body's used to practicing constriction. So we really want to see this as a practice. It's not just a habit. It's not just like a development. It's a practice. Why I love that word is because if I'm developmentally this way, it seems like I've been developed and I'm just stuck like this. 
if I pr my body has practiced this for 30 years, oh, I can practice something new. So I'm not stuck like this. It's just a practice I'm in. It's a habitual practice. The more we embody and get conscious about embodiment, we get to redirect the practice. We get to then interrupt what the body does habitually and be like, ooh, I feel you, sweetie. We're going to go this way today, even for five minutes. And eventually the body starts trusting that releasing won't equal danger. That felt like something important to leave everybody with. I really appreciated Amaka's please help me. That's important because to personify this state of something really constricting and painful and big and, and seemingly scary as please help me, we can start to understand the, the origin of these states. These are really vulnerable places. When you feel constriction in your body, when you feel terror, when you feel tension, you're feeling a part that's super vulnerable. Usually that's really young. And when that part gets triggered, the body feels like it loses agency because it reminds the body of a time where it had zero agency. So you feel stuck, you feel hopeless, and we fear it. So we're fearing a really vulnerable part that's actually saying, help me. That the, the bigger it gets, the more help it's asking for. It's almost shamanic over time because this part is like an ocean inside and the wave gets really big and it feels like it's going to take you over and then it crests and something shifts in you. And it's almost like you've had some inner death or inner transformation. It happens over and over and over again. The more you get comfortable with that sensation and you trust that activation will actually resolve, you're not just going to be stuck in it. But what we tend to do is the activation, in this case, the please help me, gets bigger and then we brace, we feel scared, we reach for something comforting and we dissociate and we ignore and avoid it, right? When what it's really asking for is connection. And that's why I love her example, please help me. It's a place that's saying, please connect, be with me, don't leave me, don't judge me, don't hate me. I'm just coming up to say something. So the more we learn how to hold that and be with that, those states start resolving on their own. I have come to learn something very amazing and convenient. The body processes trauma and stress for me. That's like, wow. <laughs> when I realized that, big one. Because I thought I had to process all my own stress and trauma alone. And that was stressful and dramatic. And then I learned, whoa, when I just relate to the body, when I give it the environment it needs, it takes over and does its own thing. I am merely the guide and the witnesser. I am not the person that heals it. The body does that. I want to just bring Camille in as we're closing. Anything you want to add from these shares you feel like are important or even expound upon any of those pieces? Mm. So many things. But um, if I had to, to leave you all with anything, um, I know we've shared a lot of information with you today. Um, but if you can walk away with anything, I would just encourage you to begin to implement the practice of pausing. Like even just coming here today was a pause. And that can be revolutionary in a world where we are just go, go, go. So first, just beginning to pause and notice. Right there is going to be a pivot in your, the relationship you have with your body. Pause and notice. Even if it's just for, like we said, 60 seconds. Can you take 60 seconds to pause? and just witness your body as it is in all its glory. Um, and then the the other thing I just wanted to, to say, um, that I know there were questions around like expanding your capacity. Um, and that's exactly what Luis was talking about. But rather than thinking about it like expanding your capacity, he was talking about it as tending to your capacity, that is working within it as it is. And I like to think of it as tending to a garden. For example, I can tend to a garden and I can give it the sunlight, the water, the soil it needs, and the tomato will grow. I don't have to make the tomato grow. I can just give it the things that it needs to allow that to happen. So again, that can be frustrating, but if we can approach this from a place of curiosity, not put that extra activation on ourselves to make something happen, it can be really supportive. Um, I'm going for my tomato emoji right now because I don't have to make it. Oh, someone else did too. I don't have to, of course, empty. I see you, I see you. No one has to make a tomato grow. It's really the truth. Nature teaches us so much about our bodies, right? We don't have to make tomatoes grow. We don't have to make the trauma or stress resolve. It will do it on its own, right? 
So thank you all for joining us. Again, if you want to learn more about the course or you just want more free resources, this Saturday is the biggest one we've ever done. Four hours, totally free. Join us. Everyone gets a replay. Okay, all the info is in the chat right now. Um, so I'll give you a minute to look so you can click it before we end this. <laughs> it's gone. But you can also go to the website or my Instagram. Uh, again, thank you. Really, really beautiful session. Mm -hmm.